There are two conditions demanded by modern man that can be considered to be criteria, the greatest possible convenience and the greatest possible cleanliness. All attempts that do not take these postulates into consideration can only lead to something of no value, and all artistic productions that are not consistent with these rules will prove incapable of living. Examples of these are legion, inconvenient staircases, everything unmanageable, un impractical, hard to clean, everything structurally wrong, all objects that are difficult to manufacture, in which therefore the appearance does not correspond to the cost of production, all furnishings insufficiently hygienic, furniture with sharp corners, chairs that do not fit the human form, and the specific uses of reading, eating, smoking or entertaining, all impractical objects of applied art, even if born of the greatest masters, and so many other things, fall into this category. It does not matter in this regard whether these objects are created for the palace or for the simplest middle class dwelling. There's a lot going on in that quote. It's a kind of strange one, isn't it? Yeah, I don't. It's, there's a slight difficulty there of knowing how to indicate the which parts are written in capital letters it, with <laughs> additional emphasis. Uh, you should do it in like angry, <laughs> yeah. uh, angry block capital Twitter. Speech, you should surely. You should like <laughs> smack <laughs> your knee for every. Um, <laughs> Yeah, Everywhere. it's also a kind yeah. of cool. Yeah, I mean, it really is a call for like, give me convenience or give me death, isn't it? Yeah. Cannot sustain life unless it's convenient. That was a little, another little snippet from Otto Wagner's Modern Architecture: A Guide for Students of the Art, uh, which we've spoken about at greater length in previous episodes, but which again kind of hoves into view in this concluding part of our Otto Wagner series, um, because we're going to be addressing uh, some of the later buildings and ones which particularly relate to this idea of function and of the kind of the style of of the moment the style of modernity yeah well i mean all his buildings are at least to him modern super modern he's someone who is a lifelong apostle of the modern but these are ones that we might start to see bits of what we would recognize as modern in them yeah absolutely so the three buildings we're going to talk about are he the imperial postal savings bank which is his largest work um a really massive office and bank complex in central vienna and also um a couple of apartment buildings and the second wagner house which are the chronology of this doesn't totally work because the um the church, which is considered much more of a sort of Jugendstil work, is actually built in the whole middle of this whole period. As I'm sure we've said by now, um, although we're nicely categorising him into styles and periods, actually a lot of this stuff overlaps a lot. And he's not someone who... He's super committed to modern, but he's not super committed to consistency, which can be rhetorically hard to justify, but I think is the right approach. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It's also possibly to do with the difference between a church and a different sort of building. So. Yeah, but, you know, he's still doing, um, like, historicist things and Jugendstil things at the sort of the same time, yeah, which I think is just, like, around. situation, client. So, modern architecture. You've heard about it, but what does it mean? Well, people, when they were, when in the great high days of modernism and talking about modernism, he was one of the people put up as a forefather. Uh, someone you could reach back to before modernism who might be showing the way. He has that character in the Fountainhead who's like the older guy. Oh, yeah. Tragic. Cameron. Yeah, yes. Cameron. Yes. Yeah. Yes. yes. One of those. Destroyed by the jealousy of lesser men. Yeah, exactly. Mm. Except uh, Otto Wagner really wasn't. He was, um, he was really uh, successful all the time. Um, although slightly blotted his copybook with the powers that be. But, you know, what can you do? What can you do when they're so stupid and annoying? <laughs> 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 uh, it's very hard, yes. Uh, we should say this is a podcast about buildings and cities with me, Luke Jones. And me, George Gingell. Yeah, just in case you're joining us for the first time, welcome, if so. Um, yeah, this is part five, but it's, it's as good a place as anywhere to uh, join us. Yeah. A lot of people do go back to the beginning, which I found kind of rather daunting. That, yes, yeah. a lot. Of, the most listened to episode is number one, yeah. um, which is more than a little, along with the first like 15 or so, more than a little ragged. I mean, yeah. I would describe us as fairly scratchy now <laughs> uh, <laughs> and uh, positively incompetent early on. We'll have been doing the podcast for five years in uh, 
the summer. Yeah. We haven't, like, the number of episodes that we put out in that time uh, slightly belies the fact. <laughs> there you go. There's a lot of, there's a lot of Yeah, we actually were starting labor. around this time five years ago. I think we put the first one out in, like, August, didn't we? But um, there were a lot of abortive attempts. Yeah. Yeah. It's good. Um, when we started, we literally uh, couldn't talk, couldn't say things about architecture without laughing at ourselves. Yeah, I know, I know. That was, there were a couple of like full starts on that basis yeah it's so funny we like had a script we couldn't read it because it sounded so stupid yeah. and now it doesn't sound any less stupid we've just got more used to it yes. so wonderfully plastic <laughs> yes it's amazing what you can get used human to human brain um anyway back to otto my thoughts on this is it's actually fairly simple in terms of it, it, thinking about what he was in his time which is that if you're thinking about modernism or what it meant, what it meant to be modern in his day, yeah. the milieu of kind of the the newly forming cultural modernity yeah. in painting or music, industrial design. He is completely, clearly a modernist. He is committed to the ideas of modernity. He is committed to a, a number of the things that even later international style modernists would be: clarity, mm. plainness, function, grand like form but he's also not an international style modernist not by a long stretch in that he is also diametrically opposed to some of their ideas he sees he doesn't see a break the break is that technology and the economy have moved on and so architecture moves along with them he sees himself in a continuous trajectory from the past stuff gets outdated we move on, progress, style progresses. But it kind of builds, like technology, one thing upon another. You know, Corbusier, yeah. he's like, engineers plus ancient Greeks equals my future vision, which is all about me. I mean, actually, he's taking stuff. Yeah, but there's, there is a sense of a reset button, isn't there, yeah. with, with, with the kind of rhetoric of, like, 1920s modernism. That's absolutely, which is not at all, Wagner's not into that. I don't, but, th I don't think Wagner was repudiating the architecture of the 1860s, for example. He, he just thought that they shouldn't still be doing it yeah, well, he's years repudiating later. Some, he's repudiating the architecture of the 1860s, which he thought was attempting to be a throwback to even further in the past. Yeah, but, some, I mean, he but, but he's not repudiating he Gottfried yeah. Semper. And he's saying... That's just not what we do now. It doesn't make sense, yeah. which is palpably true. Doing a historicist building at one time kind of is inevitably a different thing to doing another one. But anyway, so I think that's the answer, which is that he is definitely a modernist. He is one of the most committed to the idea of modernity, as in the idea of being current, people we've ever met. He will change with the times. In his, like... 60s and 70s, he's willing to go, what I was doing in my 50s is no longer what, what we should be doing. we got to move on. New paradigm, yeah. The kids, they're coming up. I've got to stay ahead of these people. Yeah. I've got to come up with new ideas. That is being committed to modernity. He's still, he's still got it into his 70s, um, which is probably about, I think the 70s is around the time you can stop calling someone a young architect. Yes. Probably like, <laughs> on their 70th birthday, they are now... Yeah, there's a parting of the ways. You're either, yeah... Up until that point, you can be young. You're either failed or not at that point. Yeah. <laughs> that's, the, that's the examination. The the division, yeah, the sheep have been sorted from the goats. So we're going to talk about this big project, which is interesting because it's kind of, if people think of Otto Wagner, they perhaps don't think of this period, but it's probably his number one project, right? It's definitely his largest one. And it is... I think the discerning architecture theory person will give this building a lot of respect i mean it is technically just about ambiguously on the ringstrasse so it is a it is a contribution to to the sort of monumental semi-axis of the of the capital um and it's the penultimate building sort of monumental building erected in and around it the only one after it is the war ministry of which more in, in just a second should we say something about what the institution is because it has a, why don't you do that yeah so it's a postal savings bank this is around the time when um all these countries were trying to get workers to save and, and you have like saving cooperatives and trustee banks and all that sort of stuff post office banks here as well everywhere it was um set up managed initially by a guy called george koch who had been sent on a sort of research trip to more advanced 
countries like the United Kingdom to see how they did postal savings and came back and founded the bank, I think, in 1880. And it was, yeah, it was a, a bank for small depositors. It was enormously successful. It got, yeah, it had sort of hundreds of thousands of people quite quickly. And it always had a sort of connection with a kind of politicised Christianity. It was a sort of small C conservative Christian shading into Christian populist anti-Semitic kind of political faction associated with it. I mean, one of the peculiarities is about it. Its headquarters before this building was a Dominican monastery. Even when it had hundreds of thousands of people banking there, it was still <laughs> it was still the case. Yeah, they make good office buildings, monasteries. Yeah. Well, yeah, sure. The organisational complex. Um, yes. Yeah, so there was a competition for this building which Wagner won with a building which looks fa- fairly similar but a little bit different. There's a whole sort of political controversy associated with Koch himself, which maybe is worth going into just because it, it's something which is definitely in the background. So he had three years of running the bank and then was sacked on what was fairly transparently like a very thin pretext to do with the as articles of association having some kind of drafting error in them. He was honourably dismissed from the service of the um, royal family, which in practice meant that he was economically and socially dis- utterly disgraced <laughs> and uh, had to move to Istanbul to run a kind of rail project where he died quite soon afterwards. Um, and as a result, he became a martyr for the people for whom this bank was of sort of particular significance, which is the, are they Christian Social Democrats? Yeah, well, the Christian yeah. Social Democrats, who, yeah. who were the sort of populist, lower middle class, anti-Semitic party of this guy called Karl Luger, who became a very influential mayor of Vienna a little bit later. He's, he's one of the uh, the pioneers of uh, using basically anti-Semitism as your core plank of your programme. I'm not sure we need to talk an awful lot about this. We don't need to talk a lot about it, but it, it's... Um, I think the thing which is interesting about it is the, like, there's a particular sort of class and political identity bound up in the bank, which is, I think, that the values... These people would see themselves as the toiling, honest, clean, respectable kind of lower middle class, true Austrians. Yes, and so there's a sort of mixture of both a kind of value on accessibility, but also a kind of snobbishness, like, wrapped up in that, both of which I think come out in the in the design in different ways. Super respectable, yeah, yeah. but also theoretically progressive. For the deserving. Yeah, as you say, bl- progressive politically for the deserving, but, like, progressive... Like, they would see themselves as, like, being a force pushing things in the right direction. So the uh, the building itself was built in two phases. In its kind of final form, it's this big, it's a kind of truncated pentagon, like, massive city block-sized thing with five internal courtyards. And um, how many stories? It's like eight. Eight stories. So it's a huge, it's a huge office building with, at its heart, a big banking hall. Yeah, built in two phases, the front bit first and then the back, back bit separately, um, although very much in this kind of similar style. If we just talk about the mass of the building before we talk about the kind of particularities of it, but stuff that's kind of general, is it's, it's as you say, it's on a square, just set off the Ringstrasse. Yeah. So you can see a little piece of the facade of it from the Ringstrasse, but not the whole thing. It's a large office building which is a new thing in the world at the time. It's not quite to what we would call a modern office building, but it is a good chunk of the way there. It's eight stories tall, which is tall. Around corridors, I mean, around um, light wells, which is not sort of modern, but there are no, there's no internal structure between the walls. So it's designed so that you can have any arrangement on the floors you want. That's kind of modern. It has big staircases for circulation, but it also has lifts. For prestigious people so it's sort of like a semi-lifted building it's a like it's a natural light but with electric lighting uh, a lift building but where most of the circulation is by stairs you can really see how it is something which exists and it, it, it's being planned like just after the turn of the century so it's at the, the the beginning of the idea of a modern office building and this was all super new yeah. something this big at the time 
um, which is easy to miss because these are the sort of things which are like extraordinarily banal now. You were saying that it was briefly the tallest building in Europe. Tallest office building in Europe, yeah, for like a year until... Uh, we, and then the next one was the Royal Lither building in Liverpool, which is like, what? <laughs> isn't there a book on the skyscraper, which is like eight stories and higher? Well, eight stories isn't very tall. And this is not a skyscraper. This is a big, fat block. Yeah, it's enormously, enormously long. And it has these enormously long, straight facades. It is yeah. There's a, there's a there's a Wagner quote floating around somewhere that modern man has lost his taste for the small and intimate. Well, like the buildings are earlier in that period, like the other Ringstrasse buildings, it's a huge block. Its effect on the ring is slightly bracketed by it sort of pushed one block off the monumental axis, so you sort of see it across a square with apartment buildings on either side. Shall we talk about? So we have we have we given its dates. So the first phase was built between 1904 and 1906. Yeah. And then the second phase, uh, 1910 to 1912. I don't know, when was the competition? I think it was a couple of years before. It's 1903. Yeah. And so they'd. So I think they announced it. I think they announced the competition in 1902, yeah. had the competition in 1903, and they start building in 1904. They so didn't, awesome. didn't hang around, did they? All sort of fairly. It's a big old project, which is early, right? Yeah. I was sort of trying to contextualise this within modernism and it's kind of before everything well yeah there are no modernist buildings by this time and this isn't really one either so in the construction of the building one of the things which um wagner was interested in and where he d- he does kind of make real sort of progress towards is the idea of building more efficiently and building in a way which can be like realized faster on site yeah i find this really difficult to disentangle because the construction method he uses is basically exactly the same yeah. as people have been using for years. Yeah. And I can't work out, like people talk about this as being a great leap forward, but what it is, is in terms of its construction, it's a, it's got masonry walls made of bricks, yeah. and then it's got beams going between them, yeah. and then it's dressed in stone, clad in stone, which is a, a construction method which was basically perfected by the Romans, well, it didn't use so much iron, actually. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's it. It's, it's, but he's certainly getting big gangs of people in. He's managing to work shifts. I, yeah. it, it, all that sort of stuff's going on. I mean, the the cladding is different. I think we should it, do, yeah, talk about the front facade. It's kind of different as much on a rhetorical level as it is, lit- yeah. like, literally. It's a thinner stone facing, and it's one which appears, at least, to be attached with these... I think they're aluminium covered iron uh, rivets, yeah, which are kind of fastening them on. The facade, as you look at it from down that little alley, you see, you see the kind of middle of it. And it's got two wings going out from either side. There's a glass covered entranceway, yeah. which has got granite piers coming down, which are kind of like, like s- curving bulbous things coming out. Mm-hmm. But this is all kind of at the detail level. There's a grey band of the bottom of the building, which is granite. And it's these pieces of granite, supposedly kind of, which kind of like bulge out at the bottom, riveted to the facade. And then above that is white marble tiles, big chunky things with big chunky rivets as well. So you get this like facade of rivets. Then there's a kind of finer course, finer, more decorated bit in the middle with more rivets. And then it's a grid of windows, and the windows are sort of portrait, single proportion, all the same kind of modern window design, which has got like a single kind of grid. Uh, and it's very, it's kind of very clear and crisp and pretty monochrome. Yeah. Um, there's little notes of blue, and then it's got a cornice, which is kind of present in, like he never drops the cornice yeah. with little uh, coffering on it or or, or you know, dentation or stuff like that. But this is a sort of slightly technical one, which I think is metal. And then above that, there's the big writing of the name, yeah. Austrian Postal Bank, in, in German. In German. Also, also abbreviated. Is this a sort of uh, like a classical affectation that you abbreviate things slightly? It's Aust- austere. I think if uh, yeah, I mean, there were various different. Like the competitions have got a different thing written on it to what to what they actually wrote on it in the end. I think if you didn't abbreviate it uh the letters would be too small you want them to be big and visible from the the street and then there's a sort of box above the the middle 
which has got wreaths on it, and there's like they look like aluminium sculptures on either end, winged women with um with the rings, very important wreaths, and then then that's kind of what you see when you look at it down down the thing. It's tough, particularly the bottom. It's still got this kind of Florentine palazzo like rusticated bottom, de- you know, delicate top, but it's also really crisp. And this grid of big windows, a lot of glass. There's not, there's no, you know, fancy frills around the windows. It's all stripped back, plain, but still uh, a kind of decorated, but decorated in a pseudo-functional way. Yeah. Facade with these mar- with these um, aluminium rivets holding on these these stone tiles. Yeah, so they don't really hold it on. That's one of the things. I'm not sure. Do they hold it? Do they hold? Do they hold the stone on in any of the buildings, these rivets? Or are they no, always, no, they're they always don't. rhetorical? Why would you have a rivet holding on a stone? I don't know. I, I mean... There's a very well-established way of holding on stone. You mortar it in place and it stays. Um, no, I don't think they're about that. And I don't think people are meant to... It's not meant to be literal. Like, people can cope with the idea that this is... It's a metaphor for... He's got a few consistent visual quirks. Like, there's always the cornice and... Through the second half of his career, these like studs on the facade, a f- facade where you've taken away nearly all the decoration of the kind of Baroque, yeah. you know, all the arches above the windows, the pediments and volutes and curly hues of various sorts, that's all gone. And you replace it with a few little simple things, one of which is covering the facade in studs and metal yeah, studs. Yeah, and you can also sort of densify the studs in places to kind of create additional additional focus. Or It's kind of somewhere between a kind of stippling pattern, yeah. like you're just making the facade in, like have visual interest on it, yes. and with a kind of techno edge, right? It, they're a bit like the rivets that rivet together a big girder for a bridge with. Yeah, which do densify... At the ends, don't they? Where you yeah, yeah. have to bring and they, the webbing they kind around. of toughen yeah. things up. And you know, if you think of that period of kind of ironwork, this is covered in these big rivets. Yeah. So it is something that would seem industrial, but here it's de- definitely feeling very classy. They, they they are very classy and tough. There's something which I've I sort of have always read as one of these yeah kind of semperian material jokes which is the treatment of the granite at the bottom where it bulges the, the individually they have a kind of bulge which is a slightly kind of gravitational belly-like bulge yeah. and it makes it feel like they are a fab a sort of fabric or a cushion thing which has been stapled to the wall with the rivet essentially so it's kind of bulging yeah. around it uh, but at the same time also feeling very much like like the standard tough band of stuff which does bother but it, you're indisputably right. I'm just pointing to the fact that it's kind of deliberately not being a single like expression. It's like an ambiguously evocative. He's trying to get away from all this obvious. This is a pediment. This is that. To this is a slightly evocative, abstract thing. We are in the age of the coming of abstraction. Musical abstraction, painting abstraction, it's all sort of starting, and this is, it's not, we're going to get rid of decoration from the facade, but we're going to abstract ornament. And in abstraction, there is ambiguity, which can be kind of fun. Yeah, there's there's a lot of playing around with materials throughout the building, but always with an eye to sort of reinforcing this idea yeah what well, it's often more like the idea of function or the idea of practicality there's a kind of iconic value given to practicality yeah but not actually ever at the expense of actual practicality just at the expense of actual expense <laughs> well should we talk about the plan first and then we can talk about some details we'll just talk about how you go in you go in you go up some stairs and then, so the main place, if you're a member of the public, you'd be going into the banking hall, which is in the middle of the, in the in sort of midland courtyard. You go through a kind of transverse lobby, so running parallel with the front of the building. And then from there, there's a sequence of spaces that you go through. You kind of go up the internal stairs and then you go through this lobby, which is running across, and then you go into the, um, into the banking hall. You should say just for the overall plan of the building, the way that it's set out, on the ground floor is you've got offices on the outside all the way around and then you have a sort of circumferential corridor which runs all the way around the sort of inner 
the inner perimeter as it were so it's um which i think is continuous with the lobby as well you kind of so there is essentially a sort of uh continuous ring of circulation that runs all the way around the the kind of five pointed outside and what i would say uh, uh, like in the first spaces the first space you come in it's all white marble it's a white marble stair now the steps are like inlaid with with lino which then is a sort of slight, still slightly techno material. It's still yeah. slightly like battleships, yeah. have lino floors, yeah. but it's mostly white marble. There's a bust of the emperor yeah. on your left, and uh, which has got a kind of coloured splash, blue gold tiles behind it. And ahead of you, it's a bright space that kind of you're led up into, yeah. which is a really exciting space do you want to describe it yeah so the banking hall itself is you have to imagine there's a rectangular light well in the center of the of the plan and it is set out it's it's sort of divided there's a kind of main i mean i should say the plan is just like a sort of early christian basilica there's like a big nave type space in the middle and then there's divided by columns there are um there's a sort of narrower part on either side and then actually set into the walls are all of the booths where you can go and talk to people i mean the overwhelming impression you get of the space is that it has this sort of semi-opaque uh, glass ceiling which um above either of the kind of aisles on the sides is is flat and above the middle is this arched vault made of glass and into which the uh, the columns which are all aluminium clad iron i think they are raw iron there are places where they're al- clad in aluminium yeah. I'm trying, these trying to find they kind of disappear yeah, up into into the into the ceiling yeah so actually all of the glass is curved um making up the ceiling in the section in section on both sides and the middle they're kind of the sides are just sort of mini me's of the middle um the columns are clad in aluminium at the feet up to a height of like eight foot maybe at the base of the at the base of the columns, riveted iron um, girders which just pierce through the and the curve is a kind of interesting one because it's not classical. It's always very train station. Yeah, it's got very um, it's a very sort of train station roof profile, but all super clean, very very bright white. The ironwork is also white, um, and the floor in fact is glass block. So it's it's a kind of complete glass. Uh, yeah, kind of fantasy. This this inner banking hall, and then yeah, apart from there are these sort of darker booths which are set into the walls for your actual transactions and things like that. But it's um the section of it. There there's a sort of outer, there's a sort of upper roof above the the inner one that you're looking at. So it's um it's it's purely a a kind of internal uh, cladding. But it gives it this. But you can't see that because it's rolled glass. Um, yeah. the, the the ceiling, this kind of curved ceiling above you, is rolled glass, which is kind of uh, translucent. It's frosted, yeah. yeah, soapy white. It's not it's not like frosted glass. It's more transparent than that, but it's it's kind of, and then the structure just goes straight through it. Um, and then the floor is a grid, a wide structural grid. I don't know what that would be like, two and a half, three meters, something like that. Um, and a bit um, longer, maybe four meters as uh, like you go forwards which is got a kind of geometric black and white tiles on it yeah. on on the structure and then between spanning between these large areas it's all glass tile all glass um, bricks um which goes down into a into a like um downstairs office area yeah there's a, i think there's a post room down there or something i'm not sure what it was originally in the there's a 90s film about the building where you can see <laughs> various pe- various people on like beige box computers in the, the, <laughs> the bank in question was using this until two years ago oh really as Did their head stop, office so they stopped using it it's been given to the university it's going to be completely screwed by getting um full of students or whatever no yeah they've stopped using it it's not it's, not, it's no longer their headquarters it's a bit of a mistake really because it's a pretty iconic it may be that they're not much that, that, like you, that the postal bank just doesn't justify this much space anymore it's a great office so the other things around here is it's so it, the materials are like semi semi um, frosted glass, white painted stuff, yeah. and brushed aluminium. The material of the future. Um, and so all the, the like feet of the columns are clad in brushed aluminium, 
which is really dealt with in a really kind of handcrafty, like you can see how it's really nice metal to work with because it's quite soft. It, everything looks like it's really been like filed back and kind of like bossed and filed back and like made like a sort of beautiful um, brass box except in aluminium. And then there are these um like uh, sci-fi alien radiators all around that, which is sort of tall columns with um, uh, racks of kind of fins and little metal globes at the top. They're hot air blowers, aren't they? The, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which look cool. And then the rest of it, it feels like a language of desks, clocks, signs, dates, um, waiting chairs, like this sort of uh, formal paraphernalia of the hall for tellers. And... It, it, it's very, very like a train station. Yeah. Like, large numbers of people are expected to come in, deposit, take money out, as you had to do. We kind of forget the amount of... You had to do everything going to the bank. It was probably only open... Yeah. If it was anything like the UK, it was probably open from, like, 10 till 2. Did you ever have a po post office savings account? No. Uh, I had one as a child. It was, the, I, it was the one still where method of identification was the book. You had a little book where it would write down how much money you had in it. Yeah, no, this was... I didn't have any of this. I don't think it ever really had any money in it. About 50 quid or something. Yes, it's for teaching you how they work. It's for teaching you about how banks work, which is you bring in a little piece of a book uh, made of paper and they write how much money you've got in it. This is a really special space, I think, kind of in the history of architecture. It's got an awful lot going on, doesn't it? I mean, the Christian thing is there in the background. The There is... if you The section of it looks like your kind of classic uh basilica section especially the especially the kind of upper the actually invisible outer glass um glass roof but it's also it's sort of it's also channeling yeah r train stations department stores the other kind of modern kind of lit from not, love spa time, spaces department stores are still near baroque or like to quite, they'll have, they might have a glass roof, but they're still encrusted in um, ornamental detail and mouldings. Oh yeah, sure. No, I just mean that. I just mean the kind of diagram of the. Yeah, but I think, um, I think, in a in a world before modern architecture, which essentially this is, having uh, the great ceremonial room, be m like free, completely free of mouldings, um, completely free of like, there's no painting. There's no, the only decoration is kind of either excessively expressed functionality in things like the, the, the hot air blowers or uh, these sort of go faster striped tiles on the floor, which are kind of like pointing, you know, it's, it's kind of like the air steward, uh, air crew kind of like going your doors behind you and in front of you kind of like go in and then go out to the sides and I think that's a hell of a step at this time it's also all white which is just not a Victorian colour it's super expressing cleanliness like it's clinical yeah like like brushed white metal and white and glass and then really like picked out clocks and and then all, and obviously all these are all kind of Promethean materials right this is all yeah they are and I guess I guess this is, you know, the intensification of a certain image of like respectability, isn't it? As well, which is about like cleanliness is close to godliness. I think the stair. I mean, the stairs, which we mentioned already, but the the way that the stairs are put together, where it's like bit of iron, bit of marble, but the bit that you actually tread on is cut out and replaced with linoleum, so it can be replaced che more cheaply if it gets worn down. Yeah. That is a real like leather elbow patches kind of thing isn't yeah. it you know yeah. it's absolutely you know no unnecessary spending making sensible provision for you know um all eventualities That's it, but also like everything done really well this is like techno shaker this room is uh, the most expressed technologically place and it is also kind of 20 percent outdoors it's completely sealed but it's um, at the bottom of a light well. It's got loads of natural light. It's heated, sure, but like it feels like a train station. A train station platform is not 
indoors in the way that a cosy office is or yeah. a cosy flat. Yeah. So this is kind of on the edge and this is kind of like the 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 um booths for the tellers kind of slip into the building. It's really cool. There's lots of cool detailing. Look it up. We'll we'll put some pictures up of the you know, like cool lamps and Yeah, the light fittings I mean look like outdoor light fittings, don't they? There's a the real yeah, there's a, there's there's a lot of detail the details that come from train stations and details that come from ships. Like, beloved of Corb. And then we go into the building. So it's got lots of different sorts of rooms on the inside. But they all exist kind of in the same way, which is that they are mostly... Well, they're either between two light wells or between the exterior and a light well. Everyone's, like, at least one desk over from a big window. There's no internal structure in, like, between... Yeah, no, you can just span across from the from the facades. So as, you know, one bit's a uh, safe deposit box, one bit's a archive, you know, various different sorts of offices and things for processing, they can all just, the plans can just sort of shift around as you go up, which feels very like a modern office. A lot of the interior, the basic bits are kind of pretty functional, but there are lots of places where it gets started to be kitted out in kind of nice interiors and bits get wooden lined at the top on the, the top floor the really fancy offices or like the floor down from the top floor you've got the kind of the directors and the boardroom area which is all kind of bright red yeah. and dark wood lined which is again kind of stripped back but feels like it fits quite neatly within a very if you had a very stripped back arts and crafts furniture yeah. there's just loads of lovely I don't know how much of it survived but in the old pictures, there's loads of lovely different interior rooms with this like different like black um, wood or kind of, you know, lovely fittings in the uh, archive and library and all that sort of stuff. And all the furniture as well. You designed all the all the chairs. There's a very there's a um, there's a hierarchy of chairs, isn't there? Where the, yeah. the there are like five different types of chairs corresponding to one's status within. In, in reality, there are exceptions to this, but the yeah. theory is everyone is on the same module. And it goes like, like lock together stool, yeah. which then gets a back, which is locked together stool is for like the tellers and for the customers in the lobby. And then it gets a back for all the like lower office people. Yeah. And then it gets arms for the kind of general staff. And then it gets little aluminium plates on the arms yeah. for uh, the like middle management. And then it gets a little cushion if you're a board member. Uh, all of which are like super restrained. Like it's just really so much about picking out. Like why do managers? Why are they going to cause more wear and tear on their chair? It wouldn't, yeah. then, no, well, they're not. It's just um. It's just a little bit of lovely aluminium to make them feel better. But it, there is um. That's the sort of militarism of it coming in, isn't it? This this yeah. The, yeah. Rank is very important. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, yeah. Are these people civil servants? Kind of. Y- yes, they are. Yeah, yeah. they literally like, are. They would have yeah. only stopped wearing military uniforms, like. Not super long before this <laughs> yeah. time. Um, uh, um, I mean, I don't think they ever. I don't think the people running the bank ever did that. But like uh, people working in the civil service certainly did. I mean, this is a super modern. It's it's different. It feels like a strange mixture of things in between ideas. I like the future this represents. Yeah, it's fun, isn't it? I like the enormous organizational complex. I like. It's nice when architecture takes on massive bureaucracy and f- finds a way to sort of articulate it but none of these offices are horrid no, they're good, aren't they? they've all got like <laughs> even the cheap ones have got like tall ceiling heights and lots of natural light and yeah. ventilation yeah in the um in the in the youtube docs up they've whacked in some false ceilings yeah <laughs> like but even then it's like it's like reasonably tall under the horrible false ceilings the horrible acoustic ceilings it's like what are we gonna do well we just got to Take out all the internal walls. Oh, it's really loud. Let's whack up some acoustic ceiling. It's also kind of Gesamtkunstwerk, right? Everything is. Everything it is, is yeah. Like total design. It's the total design, but it's the total design of of kind of complex bureaucracy with many parts, which I don't know. For some reason, I always find very like enjoyable the sort of yeah the like aestheticization of the weird minute kind of mechanics of the of uh, modern institutions is um it's fun because normally it doesn't really happen normally everything just 
nowadays it doesn't you know everything is just well we don't have all these different roles right every like a lot of people's jobs in an office now are staring at a computer and they're just like you don't have archives and you don't have all this kind of clerical work which is like sorting out the mail archiving things in different kinds of things <laughs> taking a ledger and copying it out into another ledger and then writing it out and then taking a thing recording its presence in a big book yeah it's all gone into the computer now there's no differentiation of the all of that's kind of unnecessary and it's been filled with uh replaced with all the exciting things that we do in offices now which are rather more mysterious in their operation and um, uh, we also have the emergence, or I don't know if this is the first time we've seen it in a Wagner building, but one of his last tropes, which is white tiles with occasional dark blue tile detailing. So in various places in the building, but particularly in the light wells, the walls are tiled with white tiles, and then there's a little bit of geometric banding, which is mostly just like replacing every other brick um, in a few bands with a dark blue tile, um, which renders up really dark, and which kind of symbolically corresponds to where the the capital of a kind of pilaster would be if that if those piers were. It's it's a sort of it's filling in the top of the of the pier. Yeah, it's used for that sort, of, and it, there's, it uses it to make a frame in other places or go around the the the, the, the join with the ceiling. The kind of cornice on interior points but it is something that's present on essentially all of the rest of his buildings and also um around the same time as when hoffman's doing his big uh sanatorium yeah. um and he's kind of taken up the same thing where it's all white boxes with like this blue like stretch checkerboard it was obviously something it's strange he's and it feels like a time when, like, so much is up for grabs, and then yet he's so consistent with a few bits and bobs. Yeah, he's worked rivets, out a few things, the cornice, things that works, yeah. This blue and white decoration. And it's something which just, like, to me, just means it's just so not modernist that you... What, the little decoration ...have thing? a white, a completely white functional facade, and then you frame it with a little band of blue and white decoration. It is it to me just is like this guy totally is it's convergent evolution has brought this person to this place. Yeah. At the same time, I mean, there are other. There's a lot of energy in this project which is going to be carried forward into more modernist projects, like the next stage of the sort of rhetorical hygienism that he's super into. You know, like bathrooms everywhere, everything easy to clean, everything easy to wipe down, everything so that any dirt would immediately show like you know it, uh that's going to go into a whole series of other sanatoria within which you know yeah. will will develop like very identifiably international style buildings within a, a couple of decades so, so you think about towards new architecture there's the there's the kind of idea of the of the cruise liner right yeah. which has got this quite clean linoleum floor and this continuous, unbroken, structurally unbroken bit between walls. Um, he's kind of done that. He's not saying. Sure, yeah. It's just, it just like what it means, what he's actually done is that almost completely. But it's, it's couched in a different language. The same kind of obsessions are all just, are all like rattling around in, um, Alto's Paimio Sanatorium, for example, like yeah. in the in the 20s, which is still, it's like everything has been stripped back further, but it's uh, still like... Yeah, I mean, stuff a lot, of stuff, a lot that, of stuff had changed yeah. then. Um, if you look back from this, there's not much that's really modern. People are just starting to think about it. It happens so quickly. I mean, I think the other thing which is which is of a piece with modernism about this building is less the machine age stuff than the the sort of myth of the machine the kind of myth of like technology and the way that that is so you know the in a way the like totally functionless decorative aluminium to me feels like the thing which is going forward towards modernism because it's absolutely about yeah like the machine myth the kind of valorization of of like the coming age of industry and um you know, it's also, it's missing some of the... It, there's no cars in this world. No, that's what's nice about it. Yeah. Um, 
people haven't realized that you can just like have an incredibly deep plan in your office building and just have electric light in the middle and sucks if you're there yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, rather than have just like consistently lovely tall ceilings natural light for every single person who works in this building a lot of whom are pretty uh, a lot of which are pretty like standard lower middle class like adding up jobs i mean you can cram a lot of people in with eight stories it's also, it's, like, yeah, yeah, <laughs> you yeah. Don't, like, like it's, you don't have a density problem in a city built like this. I think you're just going to have to look at it, people. Yeah, we've this got, is I've, a great I've, case study <laughs> building. I have scanned in a lot of the pictures of this building, so hopefully some of them will appear. And on they got the pretty socials. good value. They got like a hundred and even after the the second part was finished, they got like a hundred and six years out of out of that building, which is yeah. Well, that's nice. I mean the. I the, obviously there are the full ceilings had gone in, but in other respects, lots of it looked like it was unchanged. Like all the all the radiators, all the corridors, all kind of looked like they were basically the light switches were all still the original ones in the director's office. All this kind of thing in the yeah. in the nineties footage. I don't know if it's still like that, but I think it it's also. I mean, it's basically modern services have been integrated. The only thing that's missing is air con. Air con. But I guess you do have hot air blowing, don't you? So yeah, and um. Now, I might be misreading the plan, but I, I see, like, big service risers. I mean, there's definitely lifts as well, but I'm pretty sure they're not all lifts. I think there's, you know, uh, you know, there's various points. Yeah, there's definitely, there's definitely service risers, which are, like, quite big kind of cupboard-sized things. Fantastic. Um, that's really, <laughs> really important. That's kind of what you need for an office for long-term inhabitation is... Floor plates, which you can take all the internal walls out of, and big service risers that you can just put more and more cables in as required. If you want to, if anyone's thinking of having an office building that they want to be still up in 150 years, um, I don't know if the rules will be the same then, but that's what they are now. <laughs> yeah, that's an interesting little thought experiment, isn't it? No, I mean, it's very successful integration of, yeah, and very sort of prescient anticipation of what modernity is going to be about what it's gonna yeah. what the modern economy is gonna want um albeit in a sort of slightly funny institution but there you go i don't think this is a story i think this is a kind of pretty standard yeah. postage savings bank like a lot of them still going cool should we move on to the other buildings yeah let's talk we probably don't have as much to say about them but we could talk a little bit about these other late buildings did you want to say so just to say the opposite directly opposite this building on the ring what is the war ministry which wagner among others did do a competition entry for um which was won by a guy called what's his first name uh he's called bauman who was a very uh reactionary architect ludwig ludwig bauman and it is i mean i it it kind of I think it was a bit of a dis disappointment to everyone. It was one of these big um, uh, competitions that all of the people in Aranda culture enter. Yeah. Um, and I don't know why they thought it was going to go because this is the it's the army. It's the most reactionary institution in the country. All, always. <laughs> anyway, I mean, the thing which they selected, it's got a real case of the sort of Buckingham Palaces about it. This like very... I think, I think it might even be... Like Buckingham Palace is a kind of fairly successful, like weirdly late bit of like just convincing people it's been... It's, it's not a good building, but it's good at convincing people it's been there for a while. Yeah. This is real, real constipated Baroque. Yeah, we've got these terrible little, like pathetic little pediments on either side. Like looking yeah. like little well, it's cheese it was slices. Originally, the the original thing was they were going to have like the world's biggest uh, double headed eagle on the top, which got kind of value engineered down to just an enormous double headed <laughs> eagle with a you know with the imperial crest, and yeah, everyone put in a proposal for this. The way that you did competition entries at that time was that uh, conv like conventionally you would give yours a name. Which I think yeah. maybe people still do in some competitions anyway. Adolf Loos entered one which was called Homo. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know why. <laughs> yeah, Apparently, same. Everything's the same, you know. Um, Wagner's was called Palace. Yeah. So Wagner's is, and you can see his flexibility. So um, uh, Losis is kind of really stretching towards modernism, 
And people had, and he'd done some buildings by then, you know. I mean, before the, um, around the time of the bank, he'd basically done like those two cafes, right? The uh, American Bar and the, the Museum Cafe, which is kind of interiors projects, really. Pretty cool ones. There's a lot going on. Um, but at this point, I think he's uh, starting to do the first of his like modernist houses. This is Los. And so his is kind of, whereas Otto Wagner's has got a lot of decoration on it. He's kind of gone, okay, I know. I'm going to be realistic here. This is for, this is uh, for the empire. It's got to be twiddles. But the massing is is kind of proto-modernist. It's grid blocky. There's no pediments. It's all horizontals and verticals. But it's got triumphal columns statues swags but in a kind of crisp boxy language they didn't stand a chance they shouldn't have got their hopes up i can't see what i can't i can't understand why they thought they had a chance with this yeah behind those uh behind those serene windows were all of the extraordinary incompetences of the uh austrian military machine which was gonna show up to the um, detriment of so many artists at the time, as they're all sent into pointless attacks against the almost as incompetent Russians. <laughs> um, but, like, anyway. Everyone basically took turns to machine gun, the, like, each other's youth. Into their... uh, the Russians decided at the beginning that the Austrians were not much of a threat and were like, oh, we're going to have to cope with these Germans. And... Basically, they were right. Uh, they were just extraordinarily rubbish. They put a lot of money into like fortifying the Dalmatian coast and stuff, which was tangent. Different, yeah. po- little, different little podcast. Tangent, little tangent. Just good to remember that like this kind of new stuff is going on a background of extraordinary reaction and incompetence. <laughs> um, so the Ministry of War is in fact the last um, like major monumental addition to the Ringstrasse. Yeah. It's. I mean, it's basically finished like three years before the war. I think the two are kind of facing each other across, across this long square the past and the future the past and the future are both going to be swept away it's just going to be a whole new world it's all gone the whole thing is gone in a few years after this but before it goes we've got a few more buildings so should we talk about the little house quickly and then i think we could finish on the apartments sure which actually i think is the last building he did he had built himself this large rather impractical house with all this kind of stained glass um very fine which he hardly lived in. He generally lived in modest flats in like a, in whatever block he was building at the time. But around the start, around the turn of the century, maybe like around sort of nineteen oh five ish, he was thinking about building. Well, he was thinking uh, rather sadly. He sort of was thinking. You know, he's getting on. His wife is much younger, um, and he wanted to build a little house for her to live in after he died, which they could also live in together for a bit. But although, in fact, in in the end, she did predecease him by uh, quite a few years. So, kind of core to this building is it's it's a white box, but it's got a big cornice, which is coffered. It's got a grid of very tall, thin windows. Um, three stores, so like almost square windows along the bottom and then like three square tall second row and then kind of double square third row just under the cornice. It's white, but it's got lots of blue tiles. Yeah, it's got a kind of girdle, doesn't it? It's around the middle. This cu- um, which are kind of bright. Um, and around the doorway, it's got... It's got a very loose door. The door is a little bit like a portal. It's very in a very abstracted form, like the portal to a cathedral or something like that. It's got that kind of multiple pushing out in layers. Um, and, and it's got a little stained glass, square stained glass window above the door as well. Yeah, which is sort of like, um, is that like a, a Greek soldier and a big tragedy comedy mask or something? Uh, yes, there's a big tragedy comedy mask and a Greek soldier. Yeah. Uh, all in kind of fun. Is this all, is this all by Coleman Moser still? I think, yeah. Uh, He's one of his... Yeah, Coleman Moser. One of his uh, secession buddies. Um, doing, it, doing it for the old man by this point. Cause, um, and uh, the door's cool. It's got this like bottom layer, which is like super riveted. Yeah. Um, what's the material on that? I've only got black and white photos here. The, I think it's enamel on the outside, some of it. There are these little panels, which look like they're... Um, either enamel or ceramic and then the tiles on the facade are ceramic 
jolly. It's it's funny. It's a mixture of both very Austere jolly, but jolly. a little bit yeah, a little bit restrained. It is. You can see that the idea of this being the widow's house is sort. You could sort of see it's how it's there. A bit of like tomb, yeah. in that like a little bit of like Assyrian slash yeah. Egyptian tomb vibe. Yes, you can still. Be and he happy, like never but, lived in this. <laughs> yeah, thing. like he didn't live in either of his villas really. Um, he was a kind of um. I don't think he was one for like really lavish living. He was a kind of like he didn't mind the like small domestic flat and um and uh, the slightly workaholic lifestyle. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely the workaholic lifestyle. Um, so you really see the the kind of mo- is this guy modernist thing coming out here really clearly because it's a white box. Yeah, it's white and boxy white and early r- rendered, totally flat. The windows themselves have no frames. And they have a very, very minimal sill, like a super, a kind of hairline little sill sloping out. Um, yeah, because this guy understands you, you, you've got to do a drip detail of some do, sort, yeah. otherwise you're going to get streaks all down your it's, facade. But. It's the absolute minimum that you can get away with um, as, as a kind of pure punched window uh, profile. And functionally, like although it was built a bit later, it, it was basically, the design was basically in place by 1905, which would mean this is very early modernism. But it's also got like loads of fruity figural decoration uh, in a way which is just, and it's got like a coffered cornice and all these like bobbles and stuff. It, um... In a, yeah, it's actually, I mean, there's a huge amount of ornamentation and fun going on. It's just in a language which has become very orthogonal. Lots and lots of rectangles of different sides, lots of sort of dashed lines made with... Um, with blue tile and um, lots of games of kind of presence and absence, the same sort of line being full of decoration in one place and then becoming a gap in a decoration in another place. And I don't think anyone's really taken this sort of thing up. Like the fruitier stuff done by Hoffman, Joseph Hoffman, I feel got massively taken up in postmodernism interiors, right? All these like bright, bold colours and stripy lines and kind of... And um, the white box modernism kind of obviously became everything. And this, which is kind of a slightly different path between them, which is a kind of classy restrained. Yeah, but with graphicism. Really, yeah. I don't feel anyone's really done this. I mean, maybe it's a bit too austere. But if you look at it, you wouldn't think that's austere. It's lush. You can see, I mean, yeah. You've got to be good at laying things out. You've got to be good at designing a facade to make it all hang together. Yeah, he could nail them. He could nail these facades like thirty years before this point. He's already he's already got one, one hell of a muscle memory. Like he'd done a load of like banal buildings before he'd even done any good buildings. Like this guy, this guy's got like he understands how it fifty thousand hours under the belt or whatever. And I think the way the office worked, which I think certainly is the way that Lutchin's office worked, is that he would basically like draw like sketch everything draw everything and the rest of the office were people turning his drawings into you know measured drawings he would sort of yeah. draw how he sketched e- all the massing like but, and he, but then he would get people to, to fiddle around with like the ornamentation oh yeah some of the, the orna- some of the ornament he would get people to he would get chosen people to do but yeah I think, not anybody yeah yeah, yeah. obviously like you get super talented and he, and he was able to attract super talented people um, yeah. but i think that um yes he was Doing a lot of drawing, just the yeah, fun drawing, not the boring drawing. Yeah, yeah, he didn't stop working. Um, there are a few more projects kind of in this white boxy vein. One of the hospitals in the hospital complex with the church, um, which is the Lupus Hospital, um, is uh, it's a, a big block with a slightly raised middle bit. Very horizontal lines, vertical windows, or horizontal bands across the facade, white, blue decorative pointing, um, very of its period. Um, again, we've got the emergence again of these like super tall, thin windows, which are good because it's got a fairly deep plan. So if you want to get light a long way into a pan, natural light, you need a tall window across, you know, all the different angles of the sun. And then there's the apartment block. Which actually is kind of, I mean, we put that that uh, the house in, I guess, around the point in the chronology where it's designed, sort of nineteen oh five. Whereas the apartment block is actually where he lived when he was di- when he died. 
there's a couple there's a there's a i mean as with the previous ones we've talked about i think there's like a couple of different ones next to each other there's is a sort of development of uh, um some s connected sites um so this one was built in 19 there's the, the one at Dubla Gasse and um, Neustift Gasse. I think oh, it's this called. book says 1909 to 1910. Oh, no, Neustift Gasse is 1909 and Dubla Gasse, my pronunciation will be terrible, is 1912, which is a kind of continuation. And they look, again, super modernist. This one's got a kind of um, rendered panel facade. Yeah, very, very, very flat facades. Yeah, yeah. Um, but again, with a cornice, with coffering, uh, and again with like fine blue detailing here, super stripped back. So they've got some kind of cool details again. Like this one's got like a riveted aluminium door. Yeah, the riveted door is really great. Such a superfluity of rivets. Like the one in his house, but like this is all polished. Al polished alu aluminium is a lovely material to do like hand made stuff because it yeah. it. Brushes up really nice. It's super easy to work if you're not welding it, uh, which is a bit leery, but kind of fine, I think, once you got used to it. It's just funny because it's at such a different status for it. It's become, it's become such a utility material. Yeah, but it's still really expensive, like compared to compared to steel or iron. or It's still at least as expensive. as It's still like the same price as brass, isn't it? Yeah, aluminium is not, it's not a cheap material as materials go. But, yeah, we don't think of it in that way. Whereas, actually, it looks better than stainless steel, I think. But you're, it's not great in the kitchen because it gets scratched. Yeah, there's something funny about it. It's got these these little details where there's the aluminium handrail sort of being clasped by, like, a brass, um, you know, cl a clamp holding it to the wall. It feels like a... It feels like the whole thing's going to make a battery. It yeah. feels like a meeting of yeah, <laughs> funny, funny, <laughs> funny, funny materials. Um, I love this door. Total dot matrix. It's like... Yeah, studs everywhere, yeah. and then this. I mean, one of the one of the late period things are these these super vertical windows, which become higher and higher and thinner and thinner. Which I'm not quite sure what that's about. Yeah, it feels like there's a sort of exaggeration both of verticality and horizontality. Yeah, the windows look. I mean, but also I think those would be great windows for a flat. They're almost floor to ceiling, really tall vertical panels that open inwards. Nice. No, they are nice. Yeah, the the sort of development towards abstraction in the um, Dubla Gasser one, the the lower levels, the rustication has become this kind of pinstripe ribbing going yeah. going which horizontally. Is, which is something we've seen in various places because we all saw something a bit like that, but vertical in the church. We saw this in his villa. It's cl it's a classy touch. And then on the upper stories, as you say, yeah, it's these it's these uh, vertical bands of um, blue tiles. The width is the same on both of them. It's the same thing, just rotated. And then these little borders, which at the scale of the building almost look like they're sewn. It's got something of the, like, handkerchief border or something about it. It's very fine. Yeah, precise. Yeah, fine, precise, but rather kind of cosy in a funny way. More More so than you would think from what otherwise seems like such a kind of massive abstract um piece of, of uh kind of formal mass it's just it, i just feel really sad looking at this stuff because this is like a really stripped back kind of proto-modernism and it's full of lovely things yeah. you know lovely doors and door handles and like these lovely like material touches and i feel that what happens next is that all of europe gets up and starts slaughtering each other and like inventing new and exotic ways of like gassing and bombing and incinerating and that's what everyone's going to be about for a while. And after they've done all of that, like, fripperies just seem in bad taste. Yeah. Um, for, for the kind of post-war modernism, like, it just feels so sad. Yeah. <laughs> like, so many of the, like, artists of, uh, from these places are going to go and die. It's a sort of sad end to this, what was always a sort of slightly strange thing, his involvement in the secession and these sort of movements in which he was 20 years older than everyone else and what that means is that that 
entire generation all go and get slaughtered in the first world war and he's too old and he's at home and then eventually dies yeah he, re- he kind of he refuses to participate in the black market so he's on like in ridiculously reduced rations yeah. and um gets ill and dies um pretty near the end of the war i think he uh, found it very sad because he couldn't do anything his wife was dead uh, like the situation is going from bad to worse to terrible. What a disaster! What a disaster! Like, it's so sad. It's so sad. The whole of that world, the the kind of across Europe, there's this explosion of culture that occurs just in the run up to the war. You think about what's happening in 1913 alone. All these art movements, the music. And there's so much sort of just like fun design and uh, uh, the spirit is so much jollier than yeah. than it could be after the war. There's so much more frivolity and fun. Yeah. Why do people, Why? how can you cause a, a, a riot with the riot of spring? Well, because because like culture and having fun is, is, uh, is the really important thing <laughs> for a lot of people before then. Um, in a way that you just can't say. In like 1919, when everyone's been gassed and starved and shelled, blown to pieces. Everyone's postal savings are going to get nuked as well. The, uh, yeah. <laughs> it's not a good financial situation. It's it? all... Um, um, and that's that's what happens. I feel it's... it's uh, you know, Versacrum, the magazine, and it's what's on the outside of the secession, the spring. We're coming into this, you know, these young people coming to this new world. It's just aborted, like, and there is a new world, yeah. but it's kind of well, yeah, it's different. It's in it's a different context, yeah. like, um. So here's a to end on. Do you think if the war hadn't happened, if they just managed to like not do so many foolish things, yeah. if the Kaiser had like calmed down, and the Serbs had calmed down, and the Austrians had calmed down, and we were all, do you think like in the twenties? modernism would be so stark oh gosh yeah it's a hard question isn't it what what is it that causes the sort of takeoff of do you think that would have happened anyway or do you think it wouldn't because you know early on we dealt with bruno tout and stuff and like all this like expressionism in germany and uh, and it feels like there's a lot of bright colorful fruity directions people are going in i mean i think actually really it takes two wars <laughs> Yeah, yeah, to to, modern, to, to like to, the, to, to get to really the idea where we're going to knock yeah. down all our cities and replace it with slab blocks and point blocks, it takes like yeah the complete annihilation of that cultural idea of Europe. It takes the uh, kind of annihilation of the idea of Western civilization, but it's definitely going in that direction already. In the like in the twenties, it's going that way for the avant garde, and then like everyone after the second one, War, everyone realizes. This culture was so wrong. Look what it's done. <laughs> I, I wonder, yeah. I mean, it's possible that we would just... Because the thing is, if you go to Vienna now, the apartments that they built look like this. They look like late Otto Wagner apartments, you know. They're doing it with cross-laminated timber or something instead. But but they're ultimately... Not, they're not quite as lovely, but these ones are... are oh, no, sure, 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 sure. <laughs> yeah. But basically, this is a... This is a kind of stable form for the kind of modern urban apartment. You could have a kind of alternative history where there was a sort of weird continuity between the world of uh, 1912 and that of, um, I don't know when, you know, 2000 and 2010 or whenever yeah. this kind of became re-established as the, as the sort of uh, default form. Because I think another part of it is like revolutions happen, right? political and cultural. Otto Wagner was a modernist, but he was not a revolutionary. He didn't believe in revolution. He was a kind of fairly conservative chap. He was a conser- fairly conservative chap who believed in, like, progress. Well, I don't know. I mean, I guess... His, Depends what you mean I guess for the, for the right? period, I guess he was liberal. But I um, think yeah, he yeah. was... Yes. Um, I, I, don't mean, I don't mean he's a conservative in the sense of, like, he's a political conservative, as we would say now. I mean that he believed in conserving a lot of stuff. <laughs> he didn't believe in a radical change. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He believed, it wasn't in, a he radical. believed in kind of, yeah, in continuity with the past. And uh... yeah. I mean, I know uh, there were a lot more people kind of more conservative than him, but like 
That's just because they were so... Like, wanting to turn the clock back to the beginning of the 18th century, I regard as not really a viable proposition. I think this is an interesting thought experiment. I mean, you can make, like, a comparison between the sort of secession style and then uh, and the international style. Like, why is it that one of them burns, themselves out in a, it burns itself out in a, a small number of years and the other one becomes a kind of foundational for the way in which basically all buildings in the world are built today Uh, i mean kind of external factors are part of it but i think it is also that the modernists have it's not a pure it's not purely about style like they they have observed things about the way in which technology is evolving and they have an awful lot of other stuff on their on their side which is kind of internal to the logic of and technology of of, of construction and architecture but so is otto wagner like otto wagner late buildings are completely in tune with could, could, you could you could carry on that i'm not saying this would have would have happened or would have been a good thing but i i really think you can carry on in the trajectory of late otto wagner apartment blocks and office buildings and build apartment blocks and office buildings 20 years later i, I don't see why you can't build them with slab at some point you probably get to the frame architecture wouldn't yeah, you yeah i don't see why but i think you can do that sort of thing with frame you just got to like start thinking of a different way of approaching the window or whatever yeah you can get to frame architecture and then at a certain point you get concerned about thermal efficiency and kind of back away from it again the art nouveau is a very indulgent art yeah. movement yeah. it's very expensive and fancy and fabulous and beautiful but it is something which can really it exists in the context of like high consumption and luxury with with one or two exceptions but we, yeah yeah or, or like state expenditure or, but it's not it's not it, you cannot make an argument for it being utilitarian it's not utilitarian no 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 it's a palace it's a pa- it's like a palatial style yeah even when it even when it's palace yeah it can be the palace yeah but it's but yeah whereas but that doesn't mean that all proto-modernistic art movements have to be that like that <laughs> like pulsing Brick expressionism. Yeah. Anyway, it's a that's a different sort of set of questions. But I think we leave it there. Back to the back to the guns. Yeah. The next, the next like, nearly thirty years of history after he dies, bit of a shit show. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah. Like people just were just people were just falling over themselves to think of new and inventive ways to be horrid to each other. Yeah. Yeah. The Viennese are not blameless in it either. <laughs> no, no, I mean none of these people are, but it's kind of beside the point, really. It's not. It's <laughs> the people who are capable of that. I'm sure they walk amongst us. Um, it just it just takes the situation to bring it all out. So good night. So it's a bit of a sad note to end on for Otto Wagner, but um, you can you can kind of you can kind of drift off dreaming of the alternative bright crystal future geometric cuboid with occasional artistic monumental buildings. yeah lots of lots of lush details all the lads out in their um yeah smart suits and their in their bowlers and toppers yes. i think he might have gone money to a... in their pocket ready to go shopping do you think he would have gone homburg hat eventually <laughs> i can't sure see him in sure a he fedora moved, he would have moved with the times yeah yeah <laughs> so remember Visual material will be appearing on the socials at about underscore buildings. And if you want a bit of the bonus material, um, the Patreon is at patreon.com slash about underscore buildings. If you pay us a little bit of money, you can have even more about buildings in your life. We're edited by Matthew Lloyd Roberts. Thank you very much, Matt. I know this has been quite a, quite a odyssey of Wagner. Yeah um and yes thanks very much for your reviews and for your support of the show and yeah five more years yeah it's nearly i i think we're jumping the gun i think we should do five years when it's five years of the first release all right not five years of us faffing around then we can say a little something all right bye then okay bye-bye